David Brewster here with an episode of Chord Play, and this is the classical side of Randy Rhodes. And I know I've had a lot of students over the years, and even myself, uh, you know, kind of became interested in learning more about classical guitar because of Randy Rhodes. And I know I was in high school, I was already obsessed with Van Halen, and then I made the jump to Randy. And I learned, you know, Crazy Train and all the uh, electric stuff, but then I noticed all of this nylon string, you know, classically influenced music, and I just, I wanted to learn more. And I guess my uh, junior and senior year, I did study with a local uh, classical guitar instructor at a university. And he taught me, you know, basic pieces and finger style technique and how to read music and, you know, kind of walked me through uh, the early stages of classical guitar. And I did talk about that during the uh, classical guitar primer that I recently did. And we're going to dive just a little bit deeper into classical guitar, but we're going to basically surround everything with the music and ideas coming from Randy Rhodes. As far as Randy's musical influences, I mean, you can look at, you know, Glenn Buxton, you know, from Alice Cooper, and Mick Ronson from David Bowie's band, of course, Michael Schenker, you know, Leslie West from Mountain, Richie Blackmore, you know, he had tons of electric influence, but then you also have to keep in mind that he first started studying classical guitar when he was seven years old, and that's crazy. You know, when I was seven years old, I was probably playing with Star Wars toys and, you know, playing Little League or something with my friends. I wasn't even thinking about, you know, the guitar at that time. But he started, you know, folk and classical guitar lessons at seven. He took, you know, piano lessons from his mother and music theory. And he was building his musical knowledge and repertoire, you know, before he even turned 10 years old. He already had, you know, years of experience under his belt. And uh, that's impressive. That's really amazing to notice and know that, okay, he you know, definitely became interested at a very young age. And here's an image just kind of sharing a few of his, you know, favorite classical composers and some books um, that he actually worked through. And I did a lot of research uh, putting this lesson together and I wanted to make sure I had my facts straight and, you know, some of the music that we're going to look at. But uh, here's an image just sharing some of Randy's favorites in the classical realm. But the first example comes from the song Goodbye to Romance, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at the chord progression that's kind of underlying in the intro, and kind of study that and notice it, and then we're going to notice that he basically relied on, you know, fragments of chords, or little, you know, partial chords. And that's one thing, you know, from studying classical guitar, I noticed there are a lot of etudes and pieces and studies that just use, you know, parts of chords, you know, fragments and little you know, sections, usually open-ended arpeggios, you know, where the notes of a chord are kind of spread apart. And you'll also find, you know, closed voice arpeggios where the notes are really close together. But the basic, you know, chord progression that he's outlining during the intro, it's D major, an A over C sharp, B minor, A7. And then when the verse starts, it actually moves toward D major 7. So it kind of has this airy, you know, jazzy sound when uh, Ozzy starts singing the verse. Once again there, D major, A over C sharp, B minor, A7, and then it moves toward D major 7. Now, instead of playing the chords like that, Randy played them something like this. traditional classical guitar fashion. You know, it's really just two or three notes of those chords, and they're all implied, but uh, there's enough of the chord present there that you kind of hear that progression. And you'll see there in the very beginning, you know, he's really just playing the open D string, and he's creating that melodic line on the high E string. Right there is technically fun functioning as A over C sharp, even though it's just a little piece of that chord. There's a little piece of B minor. There's a little piece of A7. And then this is going to function as the D major 7. But it is rather clever, you know, taking that progression and turning it into this. The 
next example comes from Revelation Mother Earth, and I did feature this in the Randy Rhodes chord play I did last year, and I also put together a three-for-all, you know, showing some of his licks. But I played everything in that uh, chord play episode on electric guitar, and now I have a nylon string guitar, so I wanted to reintroduce uh, the song and kind of feature it again, mainly because it's going to sound more authentic and closer to what you hear on the album. And this is interesting because he's moving between E minor and B7, and occasionally he also plays the sharp 11, you know, in the key of E, which would be that A sharp right there. So it really gives you this strong tension, which tension and release in classical music is very common. You know, you hear those really strong kind of dissonant sounds and then it releases and it kind of, you know, uh, tension and release basically is what it's known as. But it's very powerful, and you hear that in classical music, but you also hear it in blues and jazz and metal and, you know, folk, and there's a whole bunch of styles. Uh, but it looks and sounds something like this. starting with that uh, sharp 11 I mentioned earlier, that A sharp, and then the open B, and then you hear, you know, like a partial E minor. And he's really just creating a melody there, G, F sharp, and E. Right? But you hear it like this. And then you hear the chord change to a partial, you know, B7. sharp too which is interesting and he changes um, you know what he does on where the B7 as he moves through it so the first time it's something like this and then the next time moving all the way up here to this G seven and then right there it's basically I mean you could think of that a couple different ways I guess you could think of it as an E flat diminished or D sharp diminished and then uh, as he's moving through there um, it kind of moves to a, an E sus4 and then a B7 and then just finish with E minor but a really interesting guitar part, and it's melodic and very, you know, dreamy and uh, sad, but I, I really like it though. from the song D, which is a tribute, you know, to his mother, Dolores. And um, there's a lot of interesting things that happen in this piece, and I'm not going to look or analyze the entire thing. And it has been transcribed and broken down and taught, you know, for years. But I wanted to compare at least some of what he plays in this piece to, you know, some of the ideas uh, from Bach, which basically, I, I believe, Bure and E minor from, uh, you know, Johann Sebastian Bach influenced Randy and he definitely has a few, you know, areas in this piece where you can kind of see where he adapted or borrowed, you know, some ideas from Bach. And we're going to look at it basically from here. G in the beginning right there and then there's a whole bunch of these little chord fragments and pieces of chords that's kind of an implied F sharp minor this is kind of an E minor 6 D major and then C sharp minor to B minor so you have these wide kind of open spaced 
um, intervals, you know, between those notes. And all of those chords I just mentioned are implied. He's not really playing, you know, like the full chords. You know, that F sharp minor, the E minor 6, partial D, partial C sharp minor, and partial B minor. So that's interesting, you know, and when you really start studying classical guitar, you'll see a whole bunch of pieces that use those fragments and little parts of chords. So after we make that walk down, you know, the partial or implied F sharp minor, the implied, you know, E minor 6, the D, C sharp minor, and the B, then there's, you know, part of a G. And then right there, um, it's kind of, you know, changing once again. And that's kind of flirting with, you know, a major, um, kind of A7, I guess. And then a D over F sharp. And sus2, you know, with that high E string open there. And then right there, it's going to basically move back to B7. And then right here, you'll actually find a little piece of box bourre. Um, and it's using counterpoint. And that right there, that's probably the best example of counterpoint um, out there because I've seen tons of people explain counterpoint using box bourre. And you know that, that's basically the opening of bourre in E minor from Bach. And you can see, as far as counterpoint, we have two parts moving in different directions. One's going down and one's going up. And that's basically a, a good explanation of what counterpoint is. So this, you know, you'll see the low E string is moving from G to F sharp to E, while the high E string is moving from E, F sharp to G. So they're going in opposite directions. But they're happening at the exact same time. So if you've ever heard Bure in E minor from Bach, um, it's this. all of these uh, movements and it's a very demanding piece very famous piece too something like that a little sloppy but that's basically bourre in e minor and you can hear like the opening you know definitely randy kind of borrowed that for that section of d really just kind of grabbing, uh, kind of gravitating toward that A and A7, and then he ends up ending with that harmonic there on the 12th fret. And that basically would function as E minor 7, you know, with the harmonic. If you look at the notes that we actually play there. So that's a really interesting uh, section of D. really interesting you know when you dive in and you analyze um, you know a part like that and then you relate it to you know some of the inspiration of the source material which uh, would be bourre you know which I was talking and playing a little bit earlier and Bach of course is a necessary you know musician to study if you're interested in classical music and classical guitar you can learn a lot from Bach and of course you can also frustrate yourself too because his music is incredibly hard but it is really rewarding, you know, when you tackle a song or a piece or a composition and you're able to play it, you feel like, wow, okay, I'm playing, you know, I'm playing some very important music from history. And Bach is, you know, he's everywhere. Definitely check him out. The last example here, actually, I did mention in the chord play uh, that I did for Randy Rhodes last year. And once again, you know, I've got a nylon string guitar and I wanted to dive a little bit deeper. And I did notice when I created that lesson and I kind of talked about where Randy's inspiration for Diary of a Madman came from, I had some angry comments from people and they were, you know, defending Randy and they thought I was attacking him. Well, I wasn't attacking Randy Rhodes, that's fact. Uh, Randy Rhodes lifted uh, the idea for Diary of a Madman from a classical guitarist named Leo Brower 
and Leo is still alive. Um, in his uh, studio number six, I believe it's called. Um, it's basically a study, you know. Um, yeah, I believe it was written and composed and copyrighted in 1973, which that's quite a ways, you know, before Diary of a Madman. And, um, you know, basically Leo Brower attempted to sue uh, Ozzy Osbourne and Randy Rhodes after Diary of a Madman came out because it was very close to uh, Leo's piece. And I'm, I guarantee, you know, uh, Ozzy, you know, heard Randy playing it. That's kind of how the story goes. But Ozzy heard Randy playing it. He said, you know, that's the next song. You know, don't forget that. And Randy did modify it. It's not an exact copy, but we're going to talk about Diary. And then we're also going to talk about Leo's piece. And you can kind of, you can make the call for yourself. As far as what Randy borrowed from Leo Brower, um, the arpeggio pattern that Randy used is completely different, but the chord progression, at least in the beginning, is almost identical. It's just performed in a different way. So Randy was using this kind of up and down arpeggio, whereas Leo is doing something very different, but it's the same chords. So Diary of a Madman, you know, looks and sounds like this. <laughs> basically starting with this A add sharp 11 and then an A7 um, add sharp 11 just A7 you know sharp 11 and then A diminish 7 and this is a B minor 7 flat 5 over A and then an A add 9 A minor add 9 That's an A major 13, and then an E add 9. Now that's basically, you know, kind of walking through the chords there, and there's some very, you know, interesting and involved chords in that progression. Leo Brower's study number 6 is played something like this, and you can kind of make the call if it sounds, you know, pretty close to you, which I can definitely see uh, the, the influence, you know. And it's something like this. see the chord progression is very similar. It's a little different on this chord, which Randy did that, Leo did that, and then, um, you know, Randy did this, and Leo had that, but then this part's the same. And then right there it kind of splits off because Leo had that. Whereas Randy just went ahead and went to this. So it does have some, you know, variance. There's some difference between the two. But I'm not dissing Randy Rhodes at all. I mean, he's a legend and, you know, very respected and a huge influence on me when I was younger. And he still is an influence on me. But I always like tracing things back to the source and trying to figure out, you know, where it came from. Whether it's, you know, going back to somebody like Chuck Berry, T-Bone Walker, someone like that. Or, you know, maybe we're going back to Bach and Mozart and people like that, Paganini or whoever. And I like to do that because I like to see where it came from and then move my way back toward, you know, present day or, you know, the variation that was created or recorded. And I think that's really good to, you know, study something current or recent. And then if you can trace your way back, you know, hundreds of years, do it because it's really exciting and it kind of gives you a you know, stronger appreciation of the music and where it came from and you kind of notice little variations and alterations to music, which is really important.
It's going to wrap this episode of Chord Play with the classical side of Randy Rhodes. And I have some ideas that I would like to uh, explore using, you know, classical guitar and classical music and relating it to modern, you know, rock and metal and, you know, more recent forms of music. I think it's really interesting to kind of find those connections and notice, you know, things that people like Randy Rhodes have done. And of course, there's a tons of other people too, Ingbe and Alex Lifeson and there's a ton of players that have tapped into classical music and classical ideas. So I'm going to chip away and, you know, add some more lessons like this in the future. So uh, leave some feedback and some comments. Please subscribe to me like lessons and I'll be back before you know more content and material. Thank you.